<clears throat> okay, folks, let's go ahead and continue in our Matthew study. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew 24 and 25 today. Um, when I did the Sermon on the Mount a couple of years ago, I took, I took one staff devotion and just did an overview of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, we are going to do the same thing in regards to Matthew 24 and 25 today. This is the Olivet Discourse. Um, so today is essentially, we're not going to go through the scriptures, and we will, and then I'll get more into detail as to each of the verses um, and sections of, the, of this, these two chapters. But I wanted to provide you with one staff devotion where you can kind of see the structure of the discourse, how Jesus taught it, how Matthew organized it in his gospel, and some of the some of the depths of this thing, um, the it's known as the Olivet Discourse um, because Jesus delivered it on the Mount of Olives. Um, these two chapters um, have had much controversy over its interpretation um, amongst solid biblical scholars, amongst people who desire to know the truth, who have a heart to seek the truth, um, who are no question in the Lord, in, um, in, in, in the family of God, have been redeemed, bought by the blood, but disagree over the interpretation as to what Jesus is specifically speaking about in chapter 24 and 25. Um, so this, these verses right here, these two chapters, for me, have been the most difficult uh, verses that I've ever studied to stand up in front of you and teach. Um, months of, of seeking and studying and reading commentaries, listening to sermons, um, I put into these two chapters. I, I think my head... I began to bleed and swelled up because I beat my head against the text for so long and so much to be able to stand in front of you and uh, teach it, at least to be able to say, okay, Lord, I'm ready to stand up in front and, and proclaim and teach these verses. Um, the controversy um, is centered around what specifically Jesus is referring to in Matthew 24, 4 through 41. That's where the controversy um, is centered as to what specifically Jesus is speaking about here. In 24, 4 through 41, this is pretty clear. 24, 42 through all of 25, you see an appeal to be ready and what readiness looks like. That's what his point is. Here, he is teaching of... An, what's, an, he's given an account of what is going to happen. This is going to happen. Okay. The problem with the interpretation and all this controversy is what specifically is he talking about? There are three different interpretations of Matthew 24, 4 through 41 as to what Jesus is talking about. There's three different camps. Okay. The first camp is called, um, they're, they're known as preterists. The controversy here um, within 24, 4 through 41 is whether or not Jesus is talking about the temple destruction, which happened in 70 AD, 40 years or so after he was crucified, or if he's talking about his second coming. So that's the controversy, the interpretive controversy as to what Jesus is specifically talking about in chapter 24, 4 through 41, is if he's talking about the temple destruction or if he's talking about the second coming. That's the two, the two um, opposing views, okay? So the first group who believes that he is only talking about the temple destruction in 70 AD and not about second coming events but only temple destruction in 70 AD. They're known as the preterists. Okay? The second group, they believe that he is only talking about the second coming. They're known as futurists. Okay? So you got the preterists, who only believe that Matthew 24, 4 through 41, is talking about the temple AD, temple destruction in 70 AD. 
and the futurists who believe he's only talking about the second coming. The third group, which I'd like to call on the fence erists. See what I did there? That's pretty good, huh? Preterist, futurist, on the fence erists. Where I believe Ron Starcher camps out quite a bit on the fence. I, I have found myself to be planting my feet also on the fence and would consider myself to be an on the fencerist, which means I believe Christ is talking about both events. And uh, my hope over the next seven weeks as we go through these two chapters is that I can clearly articulate to you why I believe he's talking about both events. Okay? Um, those who are on the fence, arists, um, see in these two chapters what is known as foreshortening. Okay? Foreshortening um, is the idea that events in the near future, remember, so you got to put yourself back in, 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 like, right here when Jesus is teaching this on the Olivet Discourse. So this is, like, he's, this is Passover week, he's getting ready to die. We got to put ourselves back in that time, okay? So, foreshortening, the, uh, this foreshortening idea um, is the idea that events in the near future, which would be 70 AD, because we're back in the 30, right? S events in the near future, 70 AD, um, and, and those events in the distant future have similarities, okay? That there are things that are operating in both of those events, something in the near future, something in the, in the long distance future, that there are co common characteristics that are operating in both of those events. That's what foreshortening is called. Let me give you a diagram that really helped me understand what uh, foreshortening is kind of teaching, the idea of foreshortening. Events in the near future being similar to events and appearing um, closer to the events in the distant future. This is the idea of foreshortening. I'm um, kind of like a mountain here is how it was described. Okay? These are two mountains. So you got uh, me kind of hanging out on the mountain. Well, hold on. I'm a little bit taller. Okay, me hanging out on the mountain, right? This second mountain appears to be pretty close. Make sense? If I'm standing on this mountain, I'm looking at this ma mountaintop, it appears to be very close. Amen? Does that make sense? But in reality, the distance between this point and this point is significantly longer than this in reality. Does that make sense? So this idea of foreshortening, so let's, let's say that this, this identifies as 70 AD, which is the temple destruction, and this mountain is the second coming, okay? Now the, on this mountain, there are trees going on here, there's rocks, there's um, bugs crawling around. On this mountain, we see also, these, this is a tree here, let me draw a Christmas tree. And then we see rocks and stuff like that. So both of these mountains appear to have similar characteristics. Everybody follow me? I told, maybe I should have prefaced this with saying, put on your thinking caps today. This one's going to be a deep one. I said that to Rampage. Um, but this, in, this is going to require intense focus today and as we continue um, the next seven weeks as I teach through this. Um, these two mountains appear to be similar in characteristics. So 70 AD, things that are going on in 70 AD include earthquakes, um, false Christs, wars, famines, struggles, difficult situations, okay, circumstances. Going on during this time, those are, those are what I'm calling the trees and the rocks, and very similar during this time. And then also in the second coming, there will be Famines, wars, earthquakes, false Christ. You see the characteristics that are very similar in the 70 AD time, temple destruction, and the second coming time. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is foreshortening. It's the idea that although these things appear to be close, the reality is they are a long ways away, perhaps thousands of years away. Everybody good?
So again, to recap, in regards to the discourse, specifically chapter 24, 4 through 41, um, being first group, G Jesus is detailing the events that are leading up to the 70 AD temple destruction only, preterist. Second group, futurist. Jesus is only talking about the events that are leading up to a second coming. Third group, the, the on the fencerists, who believe Jesus is actually speaking about both things. And one of the things that the on the fencerists believe um, is they see the foreshortening component. That there are things that are operating in similarities, okay, on both of those events. Um, the major reason why I'm in the camp of on the fencerists, I believe that Jesus is talking about both events here. I'm not a preterist. I wouldn't consider myself a futurist. The reason why I'm on the fencerists is because of the question, because of the text, because of the specific questions that the disciples ask him. So look at, look at, we looked at this last, um, well, well, we looked at the, end, the beginning of chapter 24, last time we taught Matthew. Let's go, beginning of chapter 24. Put yourself in, a, in the context of what's going on here. Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. Where's, what is the disciples pointing out to him? the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, you see all of these, do you not? What? What is, he, what is Jesus talking about? The buildings of the temple, amen? We've, we're tracking, right? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. What's he talking about? The temple, right? Verse 3. As he sit, sat down on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be? Stop there. What are the disciples referring to when they said, tell us when these things will be? What did he just say to them? Yes. So, do you see it? How the temple is going to be torn down. When will these things be? That's the first question. And then the second question, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. So I believe Jesus then answers both of those questions. Specifically, um, 70 AD, the temple being destroyed. He's, he's gonna, this discourse that follows, verses 4 through 41, he's answering that question. And then he's the first question. And then the second question, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? That is second coming stuff. That's second coming of Jesus. These questions are really important to understand what is going on in chapters 24 and 25. I mean, I think those two questions drive the discourse. And then as I study this, I kept saying, go back to the questions. Go back to where, where, where did he start? Why did he start there? What is he talking about? So I think that those two questions drive this, the, the, the understanding of what he is speaking about. That's why I believe he's talking about both 70 AD and the second coming. So, in the Olivet Discourse in, in, as a whole, all of 24 and 25, and the first part of 24, 4 through 41, is an account of what will happen. Remember, we're back in 33 time, right before crucifixion. It's what will happen. It's account of what will happen, i.e. in 70 AD and then when he returns, which I think is thousands of years apart. Remember the foreshortening idea, okay? And then uh, in, in, verses 40, in verse 42 of 24, all the way to the end of 46, he then says, he gives an appeal to be ready. Live your life and ready for that moment. And he tells his disciples what readiness looks like, and he does that in the form of parables, and we'll go through that. Now, let's, let me give you just kind of a structure of this one, 24, 4 through 41. I am not going to get into the details today. I'm not going to explain um, today why I arrive. I'm going to give you a high-level overview of why I've arrived at this structure and what I believe he's speaking about in this specific text. But as far as questions, as we go through these verses, 
Chances are I'll answer your questions when we get to the specific verses. So hold them until we get to the specific verses over the next seven weeks. Can you dig it? How are we doing? This is so meaty at 8.30 in the morning. Hang in there, please. Let's look at the structure of 24, 4 through 41. Um, I think that what Matthew does here, he rearranges or he arranges the God. Either Jesus does it when he's speaking or Matthew's organizing his gospel this way. But I believe that Jesus speaks of the 70 A.D. temple and then he, he speaks of events that's going to happen in 70 A.D. Then he goes to second coming. And talks about that. And then he comes back to 70 AD and talks about events that are happening in the 70 AD. Then he goes back to second coming. I think he goes to the first question and then to the second question. Answers the first question and the second question. I think he goes back and forth, back and forth. Now let me explain why I think that. The word that I think marks and gives clarity, the key to understanding this, 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 this discourse as to what Jesus is specifically referring to is a very simple word. It's the word you. You'll notice as we go through this, in the sections where I believe Jesus is speak, specifically talking about 70 AD, you see the word you all over him. And then all of a sudden the word you disappears and he starts talking. And in those sections, it's clear he's talking about second coming events. And then he comes back to using the word you. Who is he talking to? Disciples. And then, he'll, and then that word will disappear, and it's clear he's talking about second coming events. And then he'll come back to you. You will see. You will hear. You, as he's talking to his disciples. So, the first section is 4 through 14. Let's, let, let me just kind of give you an idea. Uh, four, yeah, 4 through 14. Let's actually go 4 through 13. First question they ask is, when will these things be? Right? What are these things? Destruction of the temple. Amen? Look at verse 4. I'm not going to read all of the chapter, but I'm just going to give you an idea of where I'm coming from with this. Verse 4. And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you are not alarmed. For this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. So, now in verse 14, I think he switches. And, he, and now, so he, I believe he was talking about the... the um, 70 A.D. up to this point. Now I believe he switches to the second coming in verse 14. It says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Second coming. But then look at the next section, verse 15. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountain. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his hands. Let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray, sorry. Yeah, that, that, your, flight may, that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. I believe right there he's talking about 70 AD. Then he's going to switch now here to the second coming. For then there will be great tribulation such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. So, when we get to these specific verses, and as I teach through these specific verses, what I'll do is I'll explain like the process of why, why can this not be talking about the other thing? Like, for example, if, if verse... Um, Verse 17, if Jesus is talking about the second coming here, 
I believe he's talking about 70 A.D. Let's look at verse 417. Let the one who is in the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. And let the one who is in the field not return to take his cloak. Well, if he's coming back, and it's his legitimate second coming, what, why is he talking about telling him not to go home and get a cloak? And, and what's the point of all that? He's telling these people right here that it's coming. You need to get going. And I think that's the temple destruction. So as we go through these verses, I'm going to give more clarity as to why I think this section is referring to this section and this section is referring to second coming. So be patient with me as we go through this. I'm just trying to give you an overview of the whole discourse right now. Are we good? So then the next section you have verses 23 through 31. Um, I think 23 through 28, I believe he's answering the first question about the temple destruction. And then I believe in verses 29, 30, and 31, he goes back to the second coming. In verse 32, uh, the next section would be 32 through 41. I think that verse 32 through 35, he's answering the temple destruction question. When will these things be? In verses 36 through 41, um, he's answering the second coming, their second question, which is the second coming. My goal in teaching this section of Scripture like any other, is to be faithful to the text. I want the text to drive where I'm at. I want the text to drive me. Um, but I can stand up and say to you that I am not infallible. Everybody understand that? I'm very fallible. Um, and it terrifies me to think that I could be wrong. But I have to leave myself open to that possibility <laughs> that my interpretation as to what these texts specifically refer to and what these texts specifically refer to could be wrong. So I need to say that. I don't believe that I, I don't believe I am. But I could be because we're talking about an interpretation. So I'm not saying false. There's a difference here. False would be saying that these events are talking about the Holocaust. I don't believe, I think that's clear. There's two things going on here. He's either talking about the temple destruction. What are the, when will these things be? The stones being crumbled? Or he's talking about the second coming, which he makes clear throughout the discourse. So what I'm saying is that my assigning of the verses to this event and to this event could be spot on. Or could be not spot on. Cool? So the way I'm going to teach this particular, I'm spending a lot of time on this section because this is the section. Like this next section right here, this right here, 24, 44, 42 through 20, through the end of 25, man, that's easy, very clear as to what's going on here, what's the point, what's the main point, what's he's teaching. That's the one where I'm trying to, to, to be very um, um, precise in the, the teach, the studying, the teaching, dissecting, um, interpreting, and then bringing it before you. So the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to lump together the verses that... So uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to teach, next week, verses 4 through 14. Okay? Sign, um, and the verses 4 through 13, I believe, that are signs that, are, that point to the fact that it's not the end, and that a sign that points to the fact that it is the end, 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 end. Verse 14. And then, the following two weeks, I'm going to teach the sections that have the words you in it, where I believe he is specifically talking about the 70 AD temple destruction. I'm going to teach those together. Okay? And then the following week, I'm going to teach the verses that do not have the word you, where I believe he's making it very clear he's talking about the second coming. So I'm going to teach these verses in the verses that he's specifically talking about the temple destruction, and I'm going to explain why I believe he's specifically talking about the temple destruction. Logically reasoning through the reality of what he's saying. And then the next week I'll teach the verses that I believe he's specifically talking about set, uh, second coming. Again, not a futurist. Future, a preterist believe all these verses only talk about 70 AD. Futurists believe all of these verses only talk about second coming. On the fencerists, which... 
I think I might coin or trademark or something, believe that these, are, these verses are talking about both. It's not an either or, but a both and. Cool? Next section, let me just give you a quick overview of 24, 42 through uh, 25, 46, the rest of 25. Um, I believe the hinge point, which means that as he's given this discourse, the, the, the moment where it changes. Now, his point, he's teaching a different point, I believe is in verse 42. Some people would divide this up back in verse 36, but I think the word, therefore, in verse 42 is the hinge point. Verse 42, he says, this is of chapter 24, by the way. He says, Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. So right there, he switches, I believe, from, from 24, all the, verse, chapter 24, all the way to verse 41, Jesus is saying, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. In verse 42, he switches it to, you are to respond like this to the things that are going to happen. Everybody follow me? The word, therefore, I think is the hinge point in his lesson. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. This is how you are to respond to that. So be ready. And the way he teaches this lesson is three parables initially. Um, here you have the parable of the thief in verses 43 through 44. Again, so he's teaching in these three parables, he's emphasizing alertness. Be alert. Live your life alert that he can come back any minute. So the first parable that he uses to teach this point is the parable of the thief. Then he uses the parable of the faithful and wicked servants. And then he uses the parable of the ten virgins. All of those three parables are to teach alertness. Then, in, in, in verse 14 of chapter 25, he uses another parable. This is the parable of the talents. This parable is designed to teach how to faithfully use the gifts that God gives to you as you're waiting for Him to return. The parable of the talents, okay? So the first three parables teach alertness. This next parable teaches the faithful use of God's gifts as you wait. And then the, he ends this discourse with a section that we talk about all the time here at the mission, um, which is the final judgment. Um, and in that point, he's, he's saying the point of this then, um, the final judgment account, is to teach that using those gifts that He gives to us while we wait, we are to serve the least of these as we wait with the gifts that He's given to us. So we got alertness, how to faithfully use the gifts, and that we are to use the gifts to serve the least of these. Um, and it's interesting too, like, I always thought that in that in this second, in this uh, final judgment, that he's talking about even the unbelievers, but he's really not. He's actually talking about believers in um, as they fellow believers as they carry the message of the gospel across the world and they come to your town. I'm hungry. I'm naked. I'm thirsty. I've been in prison because I've shared the gospel. Come and you went and visited. Does that make sense? So he finishes then with how to, using the gifts to serve the least of these at the end of chapter 25 and the final judgment. Now, let me finish up for today. The goal, the overall goal of the Olivet Discourse is not to lead us in setting dates for his second coming. That is very clear. Because he says in verse 34, But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. So a lot of people take 20, chapter 24 and 25 and try to figure out when he's coming. And Jesus is very clear. That's not the point. You don't know. He even says, I don't know. That's a whole other discussion. I'll let Ron tackle that next Wednesday. The main point of the Olivet Discourse 
is to call us to be ready for His return by habitually living alertness, faithfulness, fruitfulness, and service to the Lord and those that He sends to us. That's the purpose of the Olivet Discourse. That is the main point. To live alert. This is what's going to happen. So you need to live alert. This is what living alert looks like. Being faithful. The parable of the talents. And the wicked, and the, and the, the, the wicked servants. And the ten virgins. Be fruitful. Parable of the talents. And service to the Lord and others. The sheep and the goats. The final judgment. That's the point. Now. Think about this. All of this is coming from the disciples' two questions. When will these things be, which is the stones being turned, fallen down, and then when is the second coming? When are you, when are you, when's the second coming in the end of the age? And he gives them this long discourse that I just gave you the overview for. I'm sure it wasn't what the disciples wanted to hear. Think about it. They were thinking, uh, man, I'm really hoping he says like two months but there's no question it's what they needed to hear. Let me say that again. They asked these two questions. I'm sure it's not what they wanted to hear. But there's no question it's what they needed to hear. That's why Christ gave it to them. So we, we got to worry less about when is He going to come and more about what i got to be doing as I wait for Him to come. And that's the point of the Olivet Discourse. Amen? So, next week, we'll start by looking at verses 4 through 14. Let's pray. Again, Lord, we, um, we give you praise uh, for your word. And, uh, Lord, we thank you for the Holy Spirit. And I ask, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would um, lead me in uh, teaching. And then also, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would convict and reveal to those in attendance if I am teaching something that is not correct, that my interpretation is, is wrong. And Lord, I pray that we can come together and whether we agree or disagree over what verses you're talking about the two events, um, Lord, I, I thank you that I've seen brothers in Christ who disagree about these things, but do it in such a loving way. Um, Lord, it encourages me, um, Lord. Thank you for the clarity of your word. And we ask to um, clearly understand it. And we ask for that gift as we go through these next two chapters. We love and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.